Hello and welcome to the Spike podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and with me this week we have Spike's deputy editor Tom Slater. Hello. And Spike columnist Ella Whelan. Hi. Coming up on the show, the Tory leadership, extremism on YouTube and the Vatican's take on gender identity. Boris Johnson, 114. Who can stop Boris Johnson? Barring something extraordinary, he will be in the run We must leave the EU on October the 31st. What is lacking in this debate and in our politics is the energy of shame. I do think that it was a profound mistake and I've seen the damage that drugs do. Goes drugs past is not unique. Have you ever taken cocaine, Mr Johnson? Boris Johnson has topped the first ballot in the contest to become the next Tory leader and Prime Minister. With 114 votes, he scored nearly three times as high as his nearest rival, Jeremy Hunt. Three candidates were eliminated, including former ministers Esther McVeigh and Andrea Leadsom, while others to make it through include Michael Gove, Dominic Raab, Sajid Javid, Matt Hancock and Rory Stewart. Tom, what have you made of the leadership race so far? Um, well, it's been a bit of a circus. Um, it's been full of scandals, um, mm. some r- ridiculous, some not so ridiculous. And the result that we're looking at today, Boris um, topping the MPs ballot in the first round was really nothing anyone wasn't expecting. Obviously, a lot of MPs were falling in behind him, even Remainers and members of the cabinet had come to the conclusion that he is the man they need right now. Yeah. I mean, there was an editorial on Conservative Home this week said he's not the leader we deserve, but he's the leader <laughs> we need. Um, and that seems to be the mood. Um, and as everyone knows, he's very popular amongst the membership. And if he does get down to the final two, it seems pretty inconceivable that he wouldn't. He's most likely to run away with it. Um, and the rest of the field is really just a case of really the people in contention, particularly um, Jeremy Hunt and Michael Gove, just trying to position themselves as a more credible, um, somewhat pro-leave, more so in Gove's case than Hunt's alternative to the kind of buccaneering Boris Johnson. Mm. Um, There's an air of unreality to all of this anyway, insofar as if you think about the any of the candidates' prospectus, it usually comes down on a couple of things, one of which is pursuing no deal, despite the fact that it's quite clear that Parliament will do everything in its power to stop that from happening. And, the you know, whoever wins the leadership, those parliamentary numbers will not change. Yeah. Um, the other one, of course, is renegotiating um, the withdrawal agreement or at least finding some sort of exit mechanism or um, time limit to the backstop, despite the fact that not only has the EU made it very clear they don't want to renegotiate, but also there's no one to renegotiate with. The yeah. new commission isn't in place. I mean, how this would happen is really quite confusing. And then they all say that they want to stave off a general election, despite the fact that, again, to change those numbers, you would need to seek a general election. And I think just on that point, I think it's interesting that there's all this kind of consensus within the Tory party that Boris Johnson is the one that they definitely need. If you look beyond the excitement within the Tory party, it's not a foregone conclusion that he would be their say in the next general election anyway. His unfavourability ratings as of, as of about March, according to Ipsos Mori, were higher than his favourability ratings even amongst Tory supporters, not Tory members, Tory supporters. Um, so I think... You know, I think we should get into some some of the um, some of the detail of what's been going on the last couple of days. There's some interesting and funny stuff to unpack, but you can't help but feel there's a kind of an air of delusion around all of this because all of the problems are still there and the core problem for the Tories, which is their unpopularity and the sense of betrayal amongst many of their supporters, is still pretty strong. And I don't mm. see any of this changing that. Ella? Yeah, I mean, the, the delusion around Boris is really interesting because because you've had figures like Farage um, at the head of the Brexit party being mm. so successful, there's this sort of a, a bit of a kind of childish reaction that's like, we just need someone who's a kind of a, a populist like Johnson who can, you know, be a bit funny. Uh, mm. He's relatable. Um, he's a people person. Even as Tom says, though, the fact is that actually lots of people really don't like yeah. him yeah. Um, and find him a bit of a, a bit of an idiot, a bit of a clown and don't necessarily trust him. And for good reason. I mean, lest we forget the number one Brexit candidate, Boris Johnson, voted for Theresa May's deal and has in the last few days um, go- gone from saying, yes, I will absolutely pursue no deal. We will definitely leave on Halloween. Is yeah. now saying, well, it's not really something that I absolutely want to have. But, mm. you know, so he's he's already begun the kind of rowing back. Um, and the contest that he's that he's in isn't exactly the hardest battle he's ever had to fight. I mean, he's up against Jeremy Hunt mm. and then Gove, who I don't think anyone really takes seriously in relation to Brexit because he was so supportive of Theresa May's deal. And then, you know, Rob, Javid, Hancock, I mean, none of them really strike you as someone who's got a really defined and 
principal position on Brexit. So yeah, he's winning, uh, but for all the wrong reasons, really. Yeah, I mean, absolutely all of them voted for the, you know, Theresa May's non-withdrawal agreement for a start. But I mean, Boris Johnson, you, you can't trust the man as far as you'd throw him. You know, we all remember that he famously wrote two columns before the EU referendum, one advocating for Remain, one advocating for Leave. And it's it's come out in the last few days. There's been an interesting um, uh, Twitter thread on this that, um, you know, even even after the Leave vote, Boris Johnson, while publicly um, still advocating for Brexit, still advocating for, you know, leaving the single market in the customs union, was telling European ambassadors that he was actually in favour of EU free movement. So he's a very, you know... Brexiteers certainly shouldn't be pinning their hopes on on Boris Johnson um, at any rate. We, one thing we could talk about is the way that a lot of the campaign over the last week or so was dominated, not so much by politics, but by these um, drug revelations. I don't know, Tom, if you want to talk a bit about that, because you wrote about it this week. Yes, yeah, so this was interesting. This kind of really started in earnest a couple of weeks ago now when um, Rory Stewart, who I hope we'll get on to, <laughs> um, admitted that he'd smoked opium at a wedding in Iran um, about 10 years ago or something. Um, and then that kind of set the ball rolling as far as this was now a question everyone had to ask. You had uh, Andrea led some of admitting to smoking a bit of weed, as she put it, at mm. um, university. You had Jeremy Hunt claim that he thought he had had, he had drunk a cannabis lassie whilst backpacking around India, which no one believed for two seconds. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, you had the revelations about Michael Gove that in Owen Bennett's um, biography of him, which is about to come out, um, there were these revelations that he told actually his kind of leadership team uh, at the 2016 leadership race that he had taken cocaine on several occasions about when he was a journalist about 20 years ago and that really dogged him for days and days and days and then more recently it's been attempted to use it against Boris Johnson given that on Have I Got News For You also an old interview in GQ he more or less admitted somewhat jokingly to taking cocaine in the past it's been a bit of a distraction I mean especially when you considering I mean none of us think for a second that that many MPs or lobby journalists are actually shocked and appalled that people within that ecosystem take drugs I think it's fair that it's dogged Gove to a greater extent because of this um, revelation that at Actually, he wrote an article for the Times in 1999 um, decrying drugs and actually saying it's better to be a hypocrite, i.e. support prohibition but take drugs on occasion, <laughs> than just supporting legalisation out of a sense of guilt. That was a level of hypocrisy that I think it was hard for him to get over. But I think we'll probably look back on this um, peer- this part of the leadership race as light relief in comparison to what's probably coming next. Yeah, Ella? Well, it's just such a ridiculous sideshow. I'm sure lots of people listening will be feeling the same as me, which is that it's very hard to muster up any kind of interest in this leadership contest not mm. least because the Tories are so unpopular and have failed so massively over the last three years but also because the candidates are very uninteresting <laughs> on the whole so a little bit of salacious stuff about drugs and the media jumps on it mm. uh, and that has been interesting because the kind of sanctimonious rage that's been poured out against these politicians for daring to be you know mildly interesting young people let's, mm. put, it, let's, <laughs> let's put it blatantly um is a bit ridiculous but there's been also some more telling scandals in relation to the fury over Jeremy Hunt's position on abortion. Yeah. Um, which wasn't so much interesting that he was quite, he's quite clearly quite anti-abortion. He wants to see the limit put not at 24 weeks, but at 12 weeks. But also that as a former health secretary, he really didn't know very much about abortion. Mm. And you think that would be something that you probably should have be clued up on if you have quite an extreme position on it. Um, but then again, this is what's been missing from the debate. Everyone pours anger at Jeremy Hunt, all of the candidates, all of the, even those that got knocked out today, have at one point or other either abstained on abortion votes or voted against Northern Ireland, for example, um, being pushed to bring its abortion law into line with the UK. So Mm. it's not like we've, you know, it's not like Jeremy Hunt is this one really reactionary guy among all these kind of liberals. Actually, no, lots of the candidates have uh, quite poor views in relation to abortion rights, but it's that kind of, it, it shows the tone of the debate currently certainly among the media class that they don't want to actually get into into what the, these candidates really think it's yeah. all about the scandal mm. it's all about the knee-jerk headlines and it doesn't really tell you very much and just quickly on the jeremy hunt thing i think that was really fascinating because jeremy hunt has this reputation as such a flip-flopper mm. such a kind of empty suit you know there's various kind of stories of people who used to work with him when he was in business suggesting that they were surprised when he said he was going to be a, that a he was interested in politics and b he was going to be a conservative had voiced no opinions either yeah. way mm. up until that point people forget this because he's been trying 
going to take on a much more kind of bullish pro-Brexit, sometimes flirting with no deal type position in recent months. But back in 2016, when he was thinking about running for leadership as well, he was going to be the second referendum candidate. No one seems to remember that now. And yet at the same time, the one belief he seems to have held all this time is that abortion should be limited to 12 weeks. It's something that he's voiced in the past and that's come back to bite him now. So, you know, there's a lot of room to be wary about a lot of candidates in this race, but Hunt in particular is just strikes me as the most kind of untrustworthy managerialist imaginable. Definitely. And um, one other candidate I'd really like us to talk about before we wrap up is uh, Rory Stewart, who just about squeaked into the next round. I, I'm, I am absolutely fascinated by Rory Stewart because, uh, well, m- maybe not so much Rory Stewart himself, but the response to him. Rory and mania. The, Rory mania, the way that the media class has absolutely lapped up mm. every word of this quite strange old Etonian uh, colonialist. <laughs> I find it actually kind of skin crawling and the way in which people are fawning over him. I mean, take Jacob Rees-Mogg, for example. People hate him because he's the kind of Victorian, uh, old school kind of posho. Yeah. I mean, Rory Stewart is that, but he's just given himself a jazzy haircut. I yeah. mean, he's he maintains a similar kind of position of sort of like colonial throwback um, that I, I just can't get on board with. But it's also the, the I think the reason why he's been so um, applauded, certainly by media commentators for one, is that he's doing this faux going to the people people thing so Mm. he's going and there was kind of you know jokes being made about the fact that these videos he was doing where he was pretending to video himself but actually it was a (laughs) quite a high-tech camera probably being and he just had his hand stretched out but it was this idea of you know we've got to get back in touch with people we've got to it was really really patronizing Mm. but that's exactly the kind of politics that a lot of people in within the political establishment want to see which is where you just go through the motions Mm. of you go out on the street and you as one very cringy video had it approach some black people in Brick Lane and like say can we have a little film with you and it's just all really shallow uh, and that you know that's what these people want out of politics they mm. just want to be seen to being among the common people and yeah. it's, it's I find it really really cringy and he has a, a kind of new age uh, mysticism about him you know yeah. he talks in his speech about these these different energies that he wants to um, to bring into politics I'm trying to remember them all now but I think were the energies of prudence the energies <laughs> of shame the energies of seriousness and the energies of action and the fact that this speech was lauded as so wonderful was really quite strange he also dropped a real clangor in it halfway through which really made me laugh was that he said that he wanted as soon as he would get into power to put a sign above the desks of all civil servants that would say the words would you be proud to put your mother or your brother or yourself in this hospital in this school in this prison (laughs) (laughs) and yet his gaffes are kind of excused and then on the other hand his um the fact that he actually doesn't have this kind of concrete position on all these matters that people like to claim he does. He talks about how we need to make public services better, but at no point has he sketched out a plan for how he's going mm. to improve the prison system for all of our mothers. Um, there's no <laughs> sense on his Brexit position, this idea of citizens' juries. In an interview with Jon Snow about a week ago, which no one seems to talk about, he um, made the point to him and said, right, you've ruled out no deal and a second referendum. Um, so what if the citizens' juries, you know, propose one of those two things? What if they propose Remain? And he just couldn't answer the question. <laughs> so again, this idea that he's fantastic is a bit strange. I also find it interesting that Remainers love him, despite the fact he's an implacable proponent of May's deal, which mm. they spent months decrying as a too big a capitulation to Brex shit and all that stuff. And I think what part of it speaks to what we've been talking about, which this kind of, you know, former um, governor in post-invasion Iraq, this kind of guy who walks around the country talking to people less out of a kind of democratic engagement more a sense of like no bless oblige like I'm here to mingle amongst the common people who I'm here to serve I think there is part of it which it just shows the hunger amongst liberal intelligentsia for our supposed betters to just sort us out and look after things before this mad populist period you know turn the world on its head it feels like that's the only way that it can explain (laughs) the bizarre and slightly creepy phenomenon that is Rory Mania You're listening to The Spike Podcast. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you get this podcast on iTunes, why not give us a rating and a review? It really helps new listeners find the show. YouTube has issued new restrictions on its platform in order to tackle so-called extremist content. It is vowed to remove any video which promotes or seeks to justify discrimination, segregation or exclusion. It comes in response to two major stories. 
Firstly, a highly publicised spat between podcast host Stephen Crowder and Vox journalist Carlos Mazza, in which Crowder made numerous homophobic jokes about his rival. And secondly, a growing fear of young people being radicalised by YouTube, best exemplified by a recent New York Times feature called The Making of a YouTube Radical. Tom, um, is YouTube turning us into extremists? Uh, No, as far as I can tell. And I think it's interesting that this is where the discussion is going now. I mean, the Kevin Roost piece in the New York Times, which focused on this character called Caleb Kane, who's a young man in America who has this story of being a kind of disaffected young person, originally a kind of liberal student type who just got really into YouTube, got into the kind of un PC corners of YouTube. And then that just led him further and further, further into the fash, basically. This is the kind mm-hmm. of argument. It's weird because you read it and you realize that this huge piece, which, you know, so much effort has obviously gone into and it's become mm-hmm. a big yeah. splash. It's really about one young man who starts watching some dodgy YouTube videos and then stops. Uh, <laughs> so this is kind of very strange, um, level of seriousness around this. Um, and the argument and Kevin Roos, I've actually heard him make this argument before, is that the algorithm and the kind of up next sidebar, which accounts for about 70% of all the time people spend on YouTube, Mm. is somehow driving people towards more and more extremist content because of the fact that on the one hand, you know, as we all know, outrageous stuff catches attention, but also that um, YouTube has created some sort of model for hard right or even far right people to make money off off of their opinions. There's not really any evidence presented to suggest that there is this kind of perfect slippery slope, but Mm. I think the reason that it's quite compelling either to that particular journalist and to people in general is it feeds into this very dodgy idea that um, radicalization or whatever we want to call it is just this kind of slippery slope you know if you allow people to encounter say just a conservative view on immigration it's only a matter of time before they're banging on about an ethno state you know yeah. that seems to be the sort of argument and i think it's incredibly dangerous and it's incredibly censorious you know this story broke just after these new restrictions came in or this feature was published rather and it seems these two things really go hand in hand this idea that you need to really censor not just the extreme right wing stuff but you need to demonetize and somehow filter out just stuff which is that little bit too conservative right wing or on PC. Yeah. Um, and I think that understanding and that pretty demeaning understanding of how human beings and their ideas work is part of the argument for why the internet needs to be regulated at the moment. It's not necessarily always just about the real scumbags. It's also about, you know, the people supposedly like flotsam and jets and kind of <laughs> caught in between. So it's um, pretty shocking stuff, but interesting the arguments they're kind of coming up to, with to support it, it feels like. Well, it's interesting thinking about what you've just said is that um, look, if you look at um, the blog that YouTube put out in order to, you know, explain what it's doing with its, um, you know, with its new restrictions, it's actually, it's actually the 30th new policy change in, yeah. a, in a year. But it even says now that we want to, you know, think about how we can demonetize or how we can direct people away from um, basically topics that are what they call borderline. Well, I'm afraid they're no longer borderline if you're marking them out as extremists. Mm. You know, so everything there is, there is a slippery slope in that sense, and that there's a slippery slope of, of censorship. And um, one of the things that's quite worrying about these policies is, um, you know, just how ham-fisted they are. I mean, so a clear example of where this has already gone wrong. They obviously are intending to, you know, censor extremists, but already. Basically, uh, you know, there's been a, fam- a well-known history teacher has had all of his lectures removed mm. because it features, you know, speeches and propaganda from the Nazis, of course, in the context of, of teaching history. But, you know, the algorithms don't know that. Um, there's been um, news channels that have been taken down. A guy called Ford Fisher uploads raw footage of um, of protests. He started out documenting Black Lives Matter. And then, you know, when he started putting out... Um, videos of some of the Unite the Right rallies in Charlottesville, you know, completely as a neutral observer, not even as a participant in these uh, or a promoter of these rallies. Again, his stuff starts getting taken down. So the danger of even if even if you were, which we never would, even if you did agree, did agree with some of the, you know, extremists being censored, you have to recognize that there is a really, you know, strange um effect on everyone else. Mm, Yeah, I mean, there was another big sort of example and scandal around this in 2017 when YouTube removed loads of footage from the Syrian civil war. Mm. And then, uh, you know, (laughs) activists then said, hang on a minute, not only is it important that people see this, but this footage can also be used, you know, in trials. I mean, it's evidence that is necessary to stay online. And they they deleted a lot of it, so they didn't manage to get it back. Um, And it sort of speaks to the fact that YouTube isn't just 
a social media platform. It's also a tool, an educational tool. It's a journalistic tool. I mean, mm. how many times have we all looked up people's speeches from the past to get quotes from them? And it would be, you know, even people like I've watched Alex Jones videos to find out what he's saying so that I can, when I write an article about him, I can talk about him. It's all those things that will no longer be there. Mm. It also completely misunderstands the nature of far right extremism or, uh, you know, radicalization with terrorism is that <laughs> what's driving these often young people, often young guys to seek out this kind of content isn't an algorithm. So it's yeah. not like if the algorithms were showing them cat videos that they'd all become cat extremists. <laughs> it's because there's something else going on that they want to view this content and they're looking for it. And the one thing to make sure that they keep looking for it and keep, get more obsessed with it is to ban it. Yeah. Because then it gives it that kind of a glamour. So it's a total misunderstanding of the political nature of what's going on here and the kind of cultural phenomenon of the rise of conspiracy theorists and the rise of radicalization, yeah. which is an, you know, a fascinating and a terrifying thing that we need to get to grips with. But the idea that you just deal with it by pretending that it doesn't exist. So you don't show the kids the algorithms and then they won't have any interest in, uh, you know, the weird stuff that's going on at the moment, like flat earth as a conspiracy yeah. theory yeah. has become suddenly reignited. You think what's going on here. It's mm. not down to YouTube. There's something bigger going on. And I think the failure to kind of make distinct Distinctions in this whole space and to lump all of these different people from a kind of un PC YouTuber through to a real kind of white supremacist character, mm. someone like Richard Spencer or Jared Taylor, all these kind of real scumbags, um, really makes the issue of trying to tackle the new far right far more difficult. Mm. Because one of the things that um, people like Richard Spencer have always traded on is the idea that the word fascist has kind of lost all meaning. It was like, oh, I'm a fascist, am I? Like everyone who disagrees with you, etc., yeah. etc. That idea of being able to kind of play on this sense. Um, that they not only have this kind of glamour, but it also actually, by lumping everyone together, if, if everyone's a fascist and no one's a fascist, if yeah. you see what I mean? And I think that's a big part of the problem today. I think it's, it's also some of these things are, it's obvious a lot of these things are connected. You know, a lot of what people are concerned about on YouTube is a weird mix of kind of just anti-feminism stuff, anti-trans stuff through to, you know, Paul Joseph Watson conspiracy th theories through to people who are really just into white supremacism and, and racism. And it's fair to say that a lot of people in that broader space, even just an un-PC space could be criticised. I think it's fair to say for holding back from criticising some of the more extreme people in the ecosystem which they find themselves. That's a fine point to make. But I think the more and more we just lump everyone together, the more and more you kind of feed the beast, which is to say that there are this whole not just that there are certain ideas that you're not allowed to express, but there are certain topics you're not allowed to talk about. That's yeah. the really dangerous thing, because then if the only person talking about them um, is the person who really does have ill intent, then um, you're never going to reach the people that they're listening to. There's never going to be that kind of counter-argument. You're listening to The Spike Podcast. Spiked has no subscriptions and no paywalls. All of our content is free and we rely on the generosity of our listeners and readers to keep us going and growing. For those of you who already donate to Spiked, we can't thank you enough. It really means a lot to the team. If you haven't already, then why not consider giving Spiked a donation? You can make a one-off payment or give monthly by going to spiked-online.com. On Monday, the Vatican flatly rejected the idea that individuals can choose their own gender. It's produced its first comprehensive document on gender identity in order to counter what it sees as an educational crisis surrounding gender and sexuality. It calls for Catholic schools to teach children that gender is fixed at birth and that there's no difference between gender and biological sex. Ella, what do you make of this uh, intervention? <laughs> I mean... Expecting the Pope and the Vatican to get on board with uh, today's modern gender politics is a bit much. I mean, I think most of us must be thinking if there's one institution that will hold out against uh, gender politics, it probably is the Catholic Church. Mm. It's kind of the point of being a Catholic that you hold um, fairly strict religious views. I mean, I can't imagine anyone's that surprised by this. Um, but actually, it does open up quite an interesting discussion about the ne the whole discussion around gender identity and self-identification and same-sex marriage, because uh, the document that the church has released is in relation to education and that it, you know, 
it's quite conciliatory in relation to saying there shouldn't be any bullying, there shouldn't mm-hmm. be any discrimination, uh, not everyone's the same, yada, yada, you know, it makes all the right signs. But the, the thing that's really upset people is it says that marriage is something that happens between a man and a woman. And like you said, uh, sex is, uh, is assigned at birth and it's got that quite solid yeah. Um, viewpoint that was made quite openly in relation to the debate around gay marriage. We had people saying that on one side, um, opposing the kind of modern gender politics. And that has sort of, that debate has never really been won or fixed. Mm. Um, and actually a lot of people, even those who aren't Catholic, still think that, uh, still think that marriage is something that, you know, it's described by critics of the Vatican as a vestige of patriarchal society. But lots of people still do think that marriage is a very traditional thing that happens between a man and a woman and that's it. And lots yeah. of people hold the very normalised view uh, that kids born with penises are men and kids born with uh, vaginas are girls you know, this isn't a radical injustice. Hmm. And so, you know, speaking as a, someone who was brought up as a Catholic, <laughs> um, I, th- I think it would be really wrong to try and force these institutions to kowtow to modern sentiments. I mean, part of the thing about religion like Catholicism or any other religion is that you sign up to its values and its values are steadfast and it's hmm. meant to be, it's meant to be this way since, you know, Jesus said it. That's why you believe in it. Um, so expecting them to kind of be liberal today is a slightly misunderstanding the nature of faith. I, I think you're right, but it's it's interesting that, of course, the Church of England are very much in favour of um, self-identification and, uh, and, and gender identity, but they're very obviously very different. And, you know, you could even... LGBT advocates were disappointed because, uh, of course, you know, Pope Francis is supposed to be a little bit different. He's probably the only pope in history where you could ever say is the pope a catholic and it not necessarily be a rhetorical question entirely (laughs) um because i mean you know there was a story for instance when he discovered um one of his uh, a catholic priest was gay and he famously said you know who am i to judge but on this issue of gender identity he has taken a much kind of um sterner line you know he's he's always said that it's a, a threat to the family in particular um alongside he said he, he put it in alongside two other threats including genetic mi- manipulation and nuclear arms mm. so um <laughs> we know where he stands on that issue but there is a certain level of odd sense of betrayal amongst kind of you yeah. know a lot of people the sense that the, you know the pope didn't come out in strong support of transgender rights i mean as you say there were these kind of points on the not just the kind of issue of homosexuality but you know just in general this view that he was a bit woke you know Mm. because he was a bit of an environmentalist and a bit of an (laughs) anti-capitalist and all this stuff so it's kind of ridiculous that people would expect um, even the catholic church to bend to the new kind of dogma around gender identity um but at the same time i think it does show um a tendency within um, discussions around transgender identity and within trans activism, which is that it, there's this demand from recognition from kind of all institutions in society. Yeah. It's not enough to be left alone. It's more that everything else has to kind of, you know, even something like the Catholic Church, there's, a, there's almost this kind of anticipation that they will eventually come round to it, which yeah. seems to be really, really quite strange. Um, and I think actually it's also what it, this really taps into is the fact that there is this concern, not just amongst religious people, actually, but people in general, that particularly around gender identity, this new um, ideology has asserted itself in places like education, in social Mm. services, incredibly quickly. Um, And it does feel like the religious people are almost like the last line of defence against this kind of stuff. I remember there was a case in 2016, this wasn't a school, but this was social workers, um, Christian parents um, of a trans girl who was about 14 years old, um, were effectively told that they might risk losing their child if they didn't accept that she was going to transition, that Mm. they should start referring to her in her preferred pronouns, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this comes um, in, despite the fact that, as we've talked about a few times, it's not as if this is a settled question, you know. First of all, from what I can tell amongst the psychological and scientific community, it's not a settled question necessarily, but nor is it in society in general. Um, So when we get in a position where not only is... um, the Pope effectively being told off for being Catholic, but also um, this is treated as such an aberration. I think it does speak to the fact, um, as we've talked about a lot of times on this podcast, that you have this new ideology, which has 
suddenly attained so much power and has this force field built around it, um, despite the fact that no one seems to be have consulted on <laughs> it suddenly being the norm now. It's just something which has kind of crept in there. I think it's interesting also how um, surprising it is. You know, we're, we're almost dumbfounded these days when a religious group expresses their religious beliefs. And, you know, in one of the a good example of that might be in Birmingham, you know, lots of people protesting, lots of Muslim parents protesting um, against children being taught about homosexual relationships. And, and you're kind of thinking, people and people are outraged by this, but you're kind of thinking, what do you expect? You know, that is their strongly held mm. belief. Of course, they're going to protest against it. But, it. but it almost seems unfathomable. As you say, you know, we expect almost everyone to sort of roll over or um, just go along with uh, all modern ideas and not even have not take their own view. Yeah, you're criticising religion for being intolerant, I mean, yeah. which it is, uh, yeah. but being massively intolerant yourself, yeah. intolerant mm. to religious freedom, to ability for people to think differently to you. I mean, if you don't like the fact that the Pope won't, reaffirm your gender identity don't become a bloody catholic then or <laughs> do what most of us did who were brought up catholic of our generation as you get to about seven or eight and you'll get sick of being told that you can't do stuff and so you think okay then i'm not going to pray anymore and like that's it you know you just it's something that you can leave aside i mean faith and religion is a choice and people should be allowed to have that choice it's also funny because of all the religions, Catholicism is the one that Catholics break the most. I mean, mm. show me a good Catholic, they don't exist. And and Catholic schools um, are generally quite lenient. I mean, these things don't just don't mm. come up. Uh, it's not a kind of a fire and brimstone situation in which kids are sort of brainwashed into being anti-trans and uh, homophobics. It's just not the case. And certainly in the UK, it isn't. So this whole kind of storm in a teacup, I think, says a lot more about the intolerance of the, uh, you know, of LGBT politics today in general, whether it's from the trans side or kind of radical queer politics, and um, that just wants everyone to reaffirm them, even someone as someone like the Pope who just, you know, is not going to get on board with gender politics. I think it's time to suck it up. Thank you for listening to the Spike podcast. We'll be back next week. And in the meantime, for more great Spike content or to make a donation, just visit spikes-online.com.